Okay, so in this lecture, we'll talk about quantum complexity theory or the limits of quantum computation. So I realize that um, uh, that some of this lecture would, is probably too advanced for some of you. So, you know, please um, uh, just listen to the parts that you you can follow and you can skip much of it. Okay, so so with that uh, as the ground rules, let's let's try to understand what what's one of the most important issues in quantum computation. So one of the most important issues is whether you can get exponential speed ups for NP-complete problems. So we saw what an NP-complete problem is. So it's a problem like satisfiability, where you're trying to search for a needle in a haystack. So for example, you're given some Boolean formula like this on n variables, x1 through xn, and you want to know whether there's a satisfying assignment. Now there are capital N equal to two to the little n possible assignments, and you might be look, looking for the single assignment that's a satisfying assignment. Okay. So classically, we don't know how to do this, um, solve these problems in less than exponential time. What about quantumly? Well, we saw that we can express this problem as in terms of a digital haystack, as finding a marked entry in a table of size capital N. And and we saw that there's a there's an algorithm for solving this problem in big O of square root of capital N steps. But now for the satisfiability problem, this is just big O of two to the n over two steps, where little n was the length of the input. So it's still exponential time, although it's a smaller exponent exponential time than we had before. Okay, so what can we say about doing this, solving this problem faster? So about five years ago, the economist um, uh, printed this article about quantum computation, where it talked about a company called D-Wave Systems in Canada that announced the existence of a quantum computer. And then it went on in the article to say, in principle, by putting a set of entangled qubits into a suitably tuned magnetic field, the optimum solution to a given NP-complete problem can be found in one shot. So not two to the n over two time, but in one shot. So, well, should you believe everything you read in the news or in news magazines? Well, probably not, right? So, so here's a theorem. The theorem says that any quantum algorithm that solves this needle in a haystack problem, any quantum algorithm, must take at least some constant times, times um, square root of n time. So this should actually say some, at least some constant times square root n time. Now, what do we mean by a statement like this? So suppose we think of this function as f, so it's f such that zero through n minus one is mapped to zero one. So the marked item has f of x equal to one. And what are you allowed to do in one step? So what we are allowed to do is we have the quantum circuit for f, which computes this. Except of course, you are allowed to query in superposition. You're allowed to give the input in superposition and you get the output in superposition. So what this theorem actually says is that the number of queries, the number of times you have to you have to invoke this quantum procedure is at least some constant time square root of n. Okay, what does it not say? It doesn't say that if you were allowed to look inside the inside this procedure and understand how it works, that you would still need square root of capital N steps. It may be that there's a way around this, but but what it says is, as long as you use this, this procedure as a black box, then it takes at least square root of n time. Okay, so, so now let me, give you, let me tell you just a sketch of how this argument works. Why does it take at least square root of n steps? So what we are going to do is we are going to solve the related problem, which is instead of finding x, 
Okay, so we look at the related problem. Does there exist x such that f of x equal to 1? Okay, so we want to distinguish the case where there is a, exactly one marked item from the case where there are no marked items. Okay, and we'll say that in order to distinguish these two cases, you must take square root n time. Now, of course, if you could solve the search problem, you can also solve the existence problem efficiently. So make sure you understand that. Make sure you, you see why, if you can solve the search problem, find the x, then you can also tell whether there exists an x or not. OK, so, so now how do, we, how do we show this lower bound? How do we show that any quantum algorithm, no matter what it does, it must take at least this many steps? So what we're going to do is we'll first perform a test run on the algorithm. Right? We, are, we, are trying to, we are trying to show any algorithm, no matter what it does, is, going, is not going to succeed as long as it takes fewer than square root n steps. So what we'll do is we'll first do an analysis of the quantum algorithm. So, so we say, suppose you give me a quantum algorithm that succeeds. I'm going to test it. And how do I test it? Well, I'm going to run that algorithm on the empty haystack. Okay, what do I mean by empty haystack? Where for all x f of x equal to 0. And now, in each step of the algorithm, it performs some queries. Right? So in the, in the first step, it performs some queries, summation over x, alpha, x, let's say at time 1, x. And then at time t, it performs the same thing like this. Okay, so this is the query to x. So what we do is, for each particular x, we look at the total squared amplitude with which we are querying it. So we look at summation t equal to 1 to capital T, if they are capital T steps, of alpha x t magnitude squared. So this is the total query magnitude squared magnitude, and we are going to find that x for which this is minimized. Okay, So we, we think of that as, as the x to which this quantum algorithm is paying the least attention, and we are going to place the needle at, in that location. So we let f of x equal to 1, where x minimizes summation t equal to 1 to capital T, alpha x t magnitude squared. And we're going to claim that, that unless capital T is large, this quantum algorithm is still going to, going to answer that the haystack is empty with high probability when we, even when we place the needle at x. Okay, but how do we show this? See, the, the problem with showing this is that the subsequent query amplitudes may change depending upon previous answers. So now that we've placed the needle at x, of course, even though at time t equal to 1, the superposition is exactly the same. But now at t equal to 2, the query does not need to look like alpha of x t. Right? So how do we show that, you know, for all we know, as soon as, as soon as the algorithm even queried alpha of x, you know, this particular x, even a little bit, x star, even a little bit, then the subsequent queries start changing and then it finds the correct answer. So, so we've, we've got to argue that it can't do that. And so what we'll actually show is that the probability that the algorithm gives the correct answer. So let's call this f star. The, the, the probability is correct on f star is big O of t squared over n. So it's the, it's the number of steps squared over n. So now if t is much smaller than square root of n, 
then we know that the probability of being correct is, is very small. And, and so that proves the lower bound. That says any algorithm that's correct with high probability must take about square root of n steps. OK, so how do we argue this? OK, so, so the way this, is, this lower bound is proved is by an argument called the hybrid argument. Now, actually, this, this, um, this uh, lower bound of square root of n, the fact that any quantum algorithm of this form must take square root n steps, was discovered before Grover's algorithm for, for search. So in fact, what we were trying to do was show that quantum algorithms of this kind could speed up search by an exponential factor. And then, because repeated efforts did not succeed, we actually, you know, this, this argument managed to encapsulate the intuition about why we were unsuccessful in all our attempts. OK, so how does this argument work? So, so what we are going to do is, well, first, let's, let's represent our test run of the algorithm. So let's say that we, we have these steps, 1, 2, through capital T. And each time we are feeding, we are answering our queries in each of these runs using the function f, which is identically 0. Right? It's a test run. And let's say that we call the output of this, of this, uh, uh, of this algorithm, let's say we call it phi sub 0. OK, we know that if we were to measure phi sub 0, we'd, we'd see 0 with high probability, which represents the fact that, um, that, that there is no such x, such that f of x equal to 1. And now what do we do? Well, what we are going to do is we are going to gradually change f to f star, right? Where we, where we OK, so how, how do we do this? Well, in the next run, what we do is we answer these queries as we did before, according to f, all the way up to the last query. But the last time we, the last query that we make, we answer according to f star. So we answer that f of x star equal to 1. So now we want to know how different is phi 1 from phi? How different is the output of the, of the algorithm? Well, what do we know? Well, we know that, that since, since we ran the, ran the same algorithm up to here, the only difference is the query to f versus f star. But we know that in the last step, the query was made to x star with amplitude alpha, alpha x star of t. Okay. And so we know that the difference, the, that, that, that the distance between these two must be bounded by absolute value of alpha x star with t. Because that's, that's the only part of the superposition where we actually even notice that there's a difference between the two. OK, so now in the next step, we again repeat this process. This is where the name hybrid comes from. So, so we, we keep going up to step t minus 2. We do the queries according to f. But now in the last two steps, we make a query according to f star. So now what can we say? Well, up through here, the state of the two runs is exactly the same. But now this is where, this is where they differ. And so how much do they differ by? Well, since we are up to step t minus 2, we were, we were, this is really, this really looks exactly like the test run. So the amplitude with which we query x star is alpha x star of t minus 1. And so if the output here is phi sub 2, we know that the distance between these two vectors is absolute value of that. So wait, let, let, let me go over this argument a little more clearly. We know that that's, that's the amplitude with which we queried x versus, you know, x star in these, two, in these two queries. And so that's how much the, the two runs can tell each other apart. And so that's how far apart the state vectors are at this time step. How do we know that that's also true at this time step? 
Well, the reason is the rest of this, this computation is the same in both cases. And the, the computation is unitary, so it, it preserves the angle between, between the two vectors and so the distance between them. Okay, so, so now we can keep this argument going. We just keep stepping from f to f star one step at a time until we get to the last run where we query on f star at each step. Okay, so now we can ask, well, how much did we change the vector by? Well, you see, we had this vector phi naught. And what we did was we changed it by a little bit, changed it by a little bit, changed it by a little bit, changed it by a little bit. And how much did we change it by? Well, we changed it by alpha. Let me drop the x star. It's alpha of t, alpha of t minus 1, alpha of t minus 2, so on, up through alpha of 1. And then that's the final vector. Okay, so what's the distance between them? Well, the distance between them is at most alpha of 1 plus alpha of 2 plus alpha of t, absolute value. But now we, can, we, know that, we know that the sum of the squares of these is at most t over n. We know that summation alpha t magnitude squared t equal to 1 to capital T is at most capital T over n. So applying Cauchy-Schwarz, you know, the, the worst case, if you want to make the sum of alpha t magnitude as large as possible, you make all of them equal. And then what you get is this is, you know, this maximum value is t squared over n. Okay, so what, what would you do to maximize the sum of the absolute values? You'd make each of these equal to 1 over n. So each of the alpha, alpha sub little t, absolute value would be 1 over square root n. And so you would get t over square root of n. So that's the, that's the distance between these vectors, and that's, that's a bound on the, on the, you know, in order that you can distinguish these two vectors, the, the distance between these must be a constant because it relates to the probability that you can tell them apart. And so in order to tell them apart, it must be the case that t is large compared to square root of n. So t must be about square root of n to get constant probability of success. Okay, so that's the argument. That's called the hybrid argument.